Um, ladies and gentlemen, let's slide right into our next panel discussion as we uh, clear the stage. Uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, international cooperation and the role that it plays in crisis management uh, and also ask the question whether or not organizations like the G20 can actually help solve problems. Uh, therefore, on that account, I'd like to invite back to the stage the summit's most popular uh, moderator, Professor Iltar Turan. The stage is yours, sir. Okay, well, let, let, let me thank you for having complimented me on being a good moderator. After Sheriff's performance, I think the title no longer belongs to me. And uh, therefore, you know, I will have the more modest function of trying to manage a meeting. But uh, let me immediately invite the speakers uh, to this panel. Uh, Rue François Magro, Ambassadeur de France, uh, Sir Dominic Chilcott, Great Britain to Turkey, Lalu, oops, Lalu Mohamed Iqbal, Indonesian Ambassador to Turkey, and Sanjay Panda, Indian Ambassador to Turkey. So please, gentlemen. Ah, okay. No, it's functioning. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we may start our discussion, our special session on international cooperation in an age of uncertainty. Uh, as the keynote speaker, we do have uh, the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Turkey, Yavuz Selim Kuran, Ambassador Kuran. So let us start with him, and then we shall continue with our panel. And I'll save my introductory remarks to that beginning. So. Uh, Minister Kuran, do we have him connected? Do we have a connection? We're, we're in the process of actually establishing connection. Well, we have been doing a magnificent job of connecting so far, so I anticipate no particular difficulty this time either. Uh, Sorry about that. Some strict neutral. All right. Yes, I see the um, the deputy minister now. Itabe, please. Okay. Uh, are we connected? Very good. Uh, well, let me just say, Mr. Minister, I had actually already introduced you, so uh, <laughs> please continue uh, with your introductory remarks on international cooperation in an age of uncertainty. Thank you very much.
Uh, we, we're not hearing you, Ambassador, Mr. Minister. We have audio now. Okay, Excellencies, distinguished participants, dear friends, I would like to thank the International Cooperation Platform and its founder, Cengiz Özgencil, for organizing this very timely and important summit. You might be aware that the chair of the executive board of the platform, Kerem Arkin, has recently been appointed as an ambassador to OECD, and I wish him success. I also wish a very happy International Women's Day to all women, all women among the audience. Turkey supports international efforts to improve women's rights. We would like to see women have equal opportunities and increase their participation in all walks of life. At our foreign ministry, 92, 92 women colleagues serve at senior positions. One third of our all staff are women. We will continue our efforts to increase contributions of our women colleagues in Turkey's enterprising and humanitarian foreign policy. Dear friends, as our foreign minister, Mevlu Çavuşoğlu stated, we support fair and rules-based multilateralism in our foreign policy. We are working with several countries, including Bangladesh, France, India, Indonesia, and the United Kingdom in this direction. Therefore, I am very pleased to have here today esteemed ambassadors of these countries. We are witnessing dramatic transformation in inter international order. Instability and uncertainty, as well as unilater unilateralism, are on the rise. Almost 2 billion people are living in conflict zones. Accord according to UN World Social Report, inequality is rising for 70% of the world population. International organizations cannot meet the new challenges coming with transformation of the global order. COVID-19 has been a test that international system unfortunately could not succeed. It took 100 days for the UN Security Council to adopt a resolution on the global pandemic. We need international cooperation and a human-centered approach to tackle global problems. For this reason, we support effective multilateralism and define our foreign policy as humanitarian. COVID-19 shows us the importance of international solidarity. We provide medical assistance to 157 countries and 12 international organizations. We will continue to do our share in global fight against the pandemic. Turkey is the leading humanitarian and development assistance provider in the world. We have humanitarian aid and development assistance projects in 175 countries. Migration is another field where we have acted mostly unilaterally to support migrants and asylum seekers. We host the largest number of the refugees in the world. Over 4 million refugees and asylum seekers found protection and peace in Turkey. 3.6 million of them are Syrians. This is about 20% of Syria's population before the civil war. In total, we have almost 9 million Syrians, both in Turkey and Syria. We have spent more than $40 billion for their well-being. We constructed 28,000 brick shelters for the IDPs in northern Syria. Around 18,000 families have already settled in these brick shelters. We aim to complete 52,000 units by this summer. Dear friends, stability is only possible if there is effective international cooperation, sustainable development, and shared prosperity. Therefore, international community should strongly commit to global, global cooperation. We need a fair and effective UN system. That's why we call for a reform in the United Nations. As our president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, underlines, the world is bigger than five. General Assembly has a key role as the most representative body of the UN. Increasing the power of the General Assembly will help advance global peace and security. Ambassador Volkan Bozkır is doing a great job as the president of the General Assembly at a very difficult time. We also support several multilateral initiatives within the UN, such as Alliance of Civilizations and the Friends of Mediation. Istanbul now has become a UN center, and Turkey holds 30 UN offices in total. The latest one is the office of UN OCHA. We are also working with, with the UN to establish a UN youth center in Istanbul. 
Our multilateral efforts are not limited to the UN. Turkey is an integral part of the Euro-Atlantic area, member of the NATO and the candidate for the EU membership. We are among the founding members of the Council of Europe, the OEC and the OECD. Our engagement with, with the international community goes beyond this. Turkey has been the founder of the Organization for Islamic Cooperation and the Turkey Council. We are strategic partner of the African Union, dialogue partner of ASEAN, and observer of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Within MICTA, we contribute to promote multilateralism and good global governance. Distinguished guests, as a major global platform, G20 is born out of global economic crisis and has proven its effectiveness. We hosted G20 Summit in Antalya in 2015. During our presidency, we made inclusive economic development an essential part of the G20 agenda. First time in the history of G20, leaders adopted a comprehensive development agenda to support UN sustainable development goals. Over 820 million people suffer from hunger and poverty today. COVID-19 might increase this number to 1 billion. This is a big risk to international stability. Effective international cooperation is the best solution and G20 has an important role to play. Our leaders have already committed to tackling the pandemic and its economic impact. We endorse the action plan to support countries in need. The Debt Service Suspension Initiative has enabled least developed countries to allocate their resources on fighting the pandemic. We support Italian presidency efforts to take, these measures, the, to take these measures forward. For sustainable development, everyone needs to get a fair share from the global wealth and prosperity. Otherwise, poverty, irregular migration, and conflicts will continue to threaten international peace and stability. It is obvious, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Rising inequalities, racism, Extremism and Islamophobia are big threats to global stability and development. Protectionism, unilateralism, and mutual mistrust is the problem, not the solution. Humanity has managed to achieve so much in technology, science, and many other fields. We can achieve more and overcome challenges we face today only through cooperation and solidarity. The way forward is to establish just, inclusive, and functioning international system through effective multilateralism. We continue to do our share in this direction. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Minister. That's a good beginning. Now, ambassadors, we've been actually discussing these matters uh, starting this morning. And a number of rather uh, interesting and conflicting ideas came up. One thing, uh, Talking about the COVID, uh, what we seem to need is more international cooperation. What we need, to, what we end up getting is less international cooperation. Similarly, when we look at the global system of governance, uh, it seems that at a time when we need more cooperation because of climate change and uh, well pandemics and uh, other factors, uh, the need for international cooperation becomes all the more apparent, yet the mechanisms through which this international cooperation may be achieved seem to be declining. In fact, uh, there is some, one observer noted that maybe regional forms of cooperation would be the way to go, except uh, many of the problems we face seems to require more than regional cooperation. So uh, I am waiting with curiosity as to how you shall treat this topic. When I look at international cooperation myself, especially at a time when the old order has broken down and the new order is in the process of shaping up, but we don't know where we are going yet, I guess if I were a policymaker, I tried to keep my options open. And so how can you keep your options open? The best way may be cooperate. Because you see, the, the cooperation then becomes a win-win sort of situation because if it works, you can continue. If it 
doesn't work, you still have time to make up your mind for a later stage when you shall engage in, for lack of a better word, in more competitive relationships. Now, uh, of course, Turkey being located where it is, is very aware of the need for cooperation, but it is also subject to the winds of competition. So uh, I think to preserve peace, in the tradition of Atatürk, uh, particularly, it has always been important that we maintain a very significant element of international cooperation in our foreign policy agenda. So with those general comments, uh, let me say that I'll simply go down the list as it appears here and uh, start with Hervé Magro, uh, the French ambassador, and See him on his ideas of international cooperation. Is there a potential here for that? And in what areas should we concentrate? You don't have to answer my questions, but you may also address other questions. So please, anyway, I, and let me just add that we each have about maybe eight to 10 minutes to save the world. So use your time sparing. <laughs> Monsieur le Vice-Ministre Kulan, euh, cher professeur Kulan. Vous avez déjà parlé en français. Mais visiblement, il y a une traduction. Donc, eh bien, euh... <laughs> yes, I will speak in French. We have got translation and interpretation as far as I know. I can hear. Everybody may have their headphones to follow the translation. They are little. Actually, the other ambassadors will meet that sense. I would like to mention three points. In the previous session, it was a very interesting, actually, session, panel session. Can you hear the translation, by the way? Can you follow the translation? Okay. Three important points have been pointed out in the previous session, and they are related with us as the diplomats. We have not uh, listened to experts. For a long period of time, the experts were warning about uh, big disasters and pandemic-like situations, and within the structure of the companies, they were not uh, actually actively prepared. And within our governments, within our states, we were not prepared. We should have gotten prepared beforehand, before this event has taken place. In the previous session, it was mentioned in order not to make any mistake. This crisis situation increased the present problems. They were the problems which we were familiar with. In the diplomatic life, we were getting face-to-face uh, -face with them every day. And as the professor has just mentioned, we were having multilateral relationships. We were tackling with the real problems and United Nations problems uh, for the problems that we were tackling with. And currently, this pandemic has told us some certain things, and we will get prepared for the future by taking them into consideration. Pandemic told us some certain things, and in the future, we will come across with some certain problems. Health is very important for the future, but at the same time, climate change is also crucial. It's one of our major topics, and it is in the center of the topics. And when we are managing this pandemic situation in a short period of time, within two or three years period of time, we will manage this. We will be able to tackle, we will be able to control this because the vaccination will be uh, much more better and uh, will be disseminated. What about the climate change? What can we do in order to have an internationally active mechanism? How can we establish this mechanism? Multilateral and multinational um, problems are present and collaboration gaining a great importance to combat with them. Trump admits, during Trump's times, for example, have had a great um, impact, negative impact, the international system has started to seek for an alternative way to cooperate. This system, the present system, do have some gaps and lacking points, and it is essential to reform the present system. 
And we have seen it very efficiently that local solutions are okay, but not enough. And even the regional uh, solutions are not being sufficient enough. We need international solutions, why? In our chain, this is the most sensitive, the most important chain. And we have seen it very effectively during the pandemic process. Our countries, uh, who are facing with difficulties about vaccination, about treatment, we, we have uh, supported those countries and they are in need of our support. If we do not help those countries, if we cannot bring the welfare and health for each and every country, we cannot become healthier. We, so we need to think with this idea, with this mindset, this crisis situation taught us to work multinationally and Within this field, all of our attempts needs to be increased. This is something significant. And these problems have started to appear before the crisis situation. And in 2019, German and French uh, Ministry of International Affairs have started an initiative, and it was a multilateral approach and they have had a call to gather uh, the forces and there was an informal unity uh, union like structure and the main objective was bringing forth the importance of international law and legal system establishing it and by establishing this system uh, bringing peace and solidarity it was what was be uh, aimed to be done by 2020 the ministers have gathered uh, under the auspices of un canada mexico chile singapore ghana uh, like countries joined us and uh, all together we have started our multilateral union studies. There were three basic uh, objectives. The first one was fighting against the negative image. This multinational system is not operating was uh, the general perception and the general image and fighting against this false image and dealing with the administrative and executive problems and fighting against them and providing solutions was the main pillars of the discussions during the month of September. The health issues have also been uh, placed forward and climate change issue has this got intact and access to internet by every single individual was a very important topic. Everybody is speaking about artificial intelligence intelligence and these discussions are continuing and a bit developing how many people do have an access to internet we are speaking about digital uh, actually destruction and digital transformation and shift of paradigm we have spoken about the equality gender equality and this, today is the 8th of march and this is a very meaningful and a basic um, important topic to be mentioned in the previous session they mentioned this but we don't have any ladies among us for our panel this means that in the field of diplomacy we need to take further steps there is a long way to go and uh, uh, we need to be more inclusive in our ministries. In France, we do have some certain quotas for gender equality to recruit women more. And there are some certain quotas which we have established. And this is something very important for us. And about G20, as a response to your question, let me say this multilateral system and operate its operation is very important. But this doesn't mean that we are going to exclude any other uh, party which is not included within the system. What we criticize is uh, some certain initiatives, some certain countries are excluding some other countries. And uh, G20, we believe that uh, it's a very good example in the field of collaboration. It's a very good example to be taken. G20 members approximately 
90%, you're representing the 90% of global economy and uh, the present 20% of them are able to tackle with the major global problems. They do have sufficient sources for COVID, for pandemic. G20's main objective is acting as a global solution provider in such kind of global pandemic like uh, situations, events. And in month of April 2020, with WHO and the other G20 countries have uh, started an initiative access to COVID-19. It was the name of the project. So this is initiative's main objective was creating a collaborative force among the institutions, among the uh, civil society, creating a collaborative chain and also applying COVID treatments, vaccines, and providing access to every COVID-related topic and field and source. This was something very vital to be mentioned. This is what is needed to be done. On the international level, we need to reform and revitalize the uh, collaborations and cooperations. The present ongoing institutions may uh, be the triggering force, catalyzing force. They represent some certain group of countries um, among the world, but there are some excluded countries which we need to attain importance. Climate issue is very important in Europe, as you all know it very well. We have got a very important negotiation about green environment, and this plan is not excluding any region, any country. I mean, all of the countries should same, should take the same initiative, should take the same actually actions in such kind of a situation we can speak about an effective climate change actions and we cannot limit it with some certain regions with some certain countries this is beyond our perception it is not within the structures of european union we will not end up the climate change within the zone of european union in the following years we need to establish new initiatives we need to work together act together to tackle and find solutions with the global crisis situations and global problems my time is limited and passing the floor to my next we have a little time to take things off and to or get organized, but without much ado, Ambassador Chilko, please. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Professor Turan, and um, thank you too to the Vice Minister, Mr. Kiran, for addressing us at the beginning of our meeting. I mean, the short version of my speech is I think I agree with everything my French colleague has said, so I could almost leave it at that. But um, I do want to make a few points, um, which may be saying some of the same things, but in a slightly different way. First of all, on women in diplomacy, we're not a very good panel for Women's Day, um, but nonetheless, we are the panel you have. But I would like to reassure uh, those who follow these important issues that um, rather like the French diplomatic service, uh, there is not a law in our system but there is now a majority of our senior posts held by women uh, for the first time. And that um, if you look at the most uh, senior ambassadorships around the world or permanent representatives, for example, um, our representative at the United Nations, our ambassador to the United States, our ambassador to Moscow, our ambassador to China, um, our ambassador to Germany, and on and on and on. These, all those posts are uh, taken by women these days. So I think we are quite egalitarian now at the top of our service, which is, the, I don't wish to sound complacent, it's the first time we've arrived at this position, but um, I think it is a, a source of some pride that we have finally arrived there. Um, secondly, um, we're asked to speak about diplomacy in an uncertain world. And I was thinking about three immediate causes for that uncertainty and maybe three longer term causes. Of the immediate causes, clearly COVID-19 has generated huge uncertainty. But actually in my country, we've taken on the burden of COVID-19 at the same time as we've decided to walk out of the door of the European Union. And when your economy for more than 40 years has been oriented around membership of the European Union, I can tell you that adds a lot of uncertainty as well. 
So we have Brexit and we have COVID-19. And I think um, as a result more of COVID-19 than, than other things, we also see at the moment the collapse in demand of the world economy. And the shrinking of the world economy is also another cause for uncertainty because it obviously reduces the ability of governments and to some degree businesses uh, to manage the challenges that we all face together. And then in the longer term, uh, I agree again with what Hervé has just said that uh, we face in climate change, huge uncertainty. We don't quite know when the tipping point may be reached. If it is reached, that will bring about climate related events um, that cause the same sort of consequences that the present pandemic is causing to us all. I think in geopolitical terms, the rise of China and how the United States responds to the rise of China introduces new uncertainty for all of us, for governments, um, who will, I think, want to work with China as a responsible member of the international community, but at the same time, on occasions, will need to resist what China is doing if we feel what China is doing is bad for, the, bad for us all. So there is that sort of tension in our approach to China, and we don't really know how that is going to work out. And then lastly, as Hervé was just saying, uh, we in the UK believe very strongly in the importance of respect for international law and the international rules-based system. And maybe that system is being challenged more now than at any time since the creation of the United Nations in 1945 which is not to defend everything about the way the, rules -based, the international rules-based system is constructed now, because of course uh, it requires reform as, uh, as the world develops. And what was suitable in 1945 uh, is obviously not going to be exactly the right thing for 2021. Um, you mentioned, I think, G20 when you began this panel, um, Professor. And I think the rise of the G20 after the 2008 financial crisis and the more important role the G20 has in coordinating the leadership of the world's most important economies um, is a welcome development of the international rules-based system, which reflects the way the world has changed since 1945. And no doubt there are, there are many others that one could cite. Um, diplomacy is sometimes as much about process as it is about outcomes. And the practice or process of diplomacy has definitely been affected by the pandemic and, the, and, um, and by the restrictions that have been imposed. And it may seem a bit, seem a bit trivial to mention some of those, but the, there is an important part of diplomacy which is about building rapport and trust and confidence in order to feel that if you're going to compromise, the other side will be compromising as well, and that a resolution can be arrived at. And unfortunately, I think one of the difficulties with doing so much of our work by Zoom or virtually these days is the basic kind of human connections, which are so important for the process of diplomacy, are being eroded to some extent. And I must say, I regret that. Um, you mentioned that we haven't seen much coordination or much international collaboration in dealing with COVID-19. And I think on one level that is true. Um, however, I do think that for governments faced with large numbers of deaths at home and with health services that have been under terrific strain almost to the point of collapse, uh, you have to have some sympathy with governments that try and sort things out for themselves first before they can help other people. It's a bit like the safety video you have when you get on a plane and they're telling you about what happens if the cabin loses pressure and the masks fall down uh, from the uh, lockers above you. They do say, put your own mask on first before you help other people. And I think COVID-19 is a bit like that. I think it would have been impossible for any British government faced with 120,000 deaths since the beginning of COVID and with a national health service that was under tremendous pressure for us to have said, we'll worry about our position later, let's deal with the rest of the world. So I think, I mean, I think that's just basic politics that we have to accept. Having said that, 
as Hervé said, of course, none of us will be safe from the coronavirus until all of us are safe because we know it only requires one nasty mutation to come in from one country where it has generated into our own countries to begin to spread as we've seen uh, already in the past year with very small numbers quite quickly affecting the whole country. Um, and I think with that in mind, there are some very good examples of international collaboration. And I would point to the COVAX mechanism, which has been set up, which um, for those, there are two types of members of COVAX. There are basically uh, developed countries that are donors to it and developing countries that um, will receive vaccine from it. But everybody who joins COVAX uh, will have vaccine provided to vaccinate 20% of their population this year. Now, 20% is not the answer, but it's a lot better than 0% for many of these countries. And the United Kingdom, which has been absolutely uh, determined to sort out its own problems first, has, by the way, donated $1.3 billion, no, sorry, that's pounds, 1.3 billion pounds to international efforts to help developing countries deal with the pandemic. So there has been a lot of work going on, but maybe inevitably with the uh, media focus on one's own problems at home, one hears less about it. But I think, I mean, I think it is, is there and we shouldn't completely uh, disregard it. Um, I'm probably at the end of my eight minutes, am I? Uh, if you uh, another minute or two, you're welcome to. I just say one other thing, just say one other thing, which is an area for cooperation and collaboration. Even in the COVID pandemic, you have to say thank you to the Chinese in the very early days of the pandemic for making available the genomic sequence of the coronavirus to the whole world so that we could all have a look at it and begin to design the right uh, vaccine response. Um, I think there's a story there for us all about the importance of international collaboration on science and technology. And um, although to some degree we are, there is com competition amongst vaccine producers, the fact is the world probably needs 10 or 15 different vaccines in order to be able to vaccinate everybody. And I think that the experience of going through the pandemic together when scientists are talking internationally with each other as the best way to treat this disease, um, to, um, to test whether people have the disease and indeed to find vaccines to cure us of the disease, I think that experience will be very useful in the future as we prepare for future pandemics or future public health crises, or indeed crises like climate change, where again, a collaborative effort uh, is essential if we're going to achieve what we need to achieve. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ambassador. I was trying to extract a sentence that might summarize the general direction of your remarks, with which I tend to agree. And that is, you know, when we are making plans for international cooperation, we have to take into consideration the innate human instinct for self-preservation in uh, planning for international cooperation. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Ambassador Mohammed Iqbal, uh, actually, you know, I, I'm, I'm going down by the list here, Ambassador, but, but, you know, I'm particularly happy to see you because sure. I am part of a cooperative effort between Indonesia and Turkey. I sit on the board of indo Kortsan, so uh, I go to your country every year to the meeting of the shareholders. Uh, Thank you, I'm Professor. I'm proud to be of service. Uh, is a sure. part of a very prosperous Turkish company in Indonesia. Sure. Sure. Thank you, Professor. And first of all, I would like to thank Mr. Jengis and the team in Bosporus Summit for inviting me. And also, I would like to congratulate you because I think this is the first strategic discussion we have in the town uh, during, during this year. So uh, I'm also happy to, uh, I would like to express my happiness to see that now on the stage we have four ambassadors, two from Europe and two from Asia. It's really like Turkey. I mean, uh, situated between Europe and Asia. The, that's why I want, to, uh, uh, I want to say that it's very inevitable for, for Turkey now to see more to Asia, to look for Asia, to, uh, to, to give more attention to Asia. So while I have, the liberty of being here. If you allow me, uh, moderator, I would, I would like to say something about, about Asia. As you know that uh, the government of, of Turkey has uh, declared that 
new policy called uh, Asia New, which means that Turkey will give more attention to Asia. And we really welcome this, this initiative of Asia New because uh, it is inevitable for Turkey to see more to Asia. And it is clear that uh, economic powerhouse of the world is moving, is shifting from, from, from other part of the world to, to Asia now. As you see in the, in, the, in the presentation that among 10 biggest economy in 2050, at least four of them will be from Asia. And if you combine the, the whole GDP of the four countries of Asia in the 10 out of 10, then it's still far bigger than the rest, far bigger than, than the six. As far as Indonesia is concerned, Indonesia is predicted to move from number eight to number four. And, uh, and internally, our president has declared that while we are predicted to be number four in 2015, but we ourselves, we, we are aiming at becoming the number four in 2045. Why 2045? Because Indonesia will, our independence will be 100 years in 2045. So we are hoping that by 2045, we'll be the fourth biggest economy in the world with, uh, sorry, with GDP around 9.1 uh, billion and population around 309 million with the growth five to six uh, percent per year. Now let me touch upon the issue that we have on the table now. It's uh, international cooperation in the age of uh, uncertainty. I don't want to talk too much about the pandemic anymore because we have listened enough this morning, both the uh, pessimistic side and also the optimistic side, no matter how different they are between the pessimistic and, and the optimistic, at the end, they came to the same conclusion. The only certainty that we have nowadays is the uncertainty itself. And I tend to agree with those who say that this is for the first time in, the, in our modern history that we are, we are facing a global, global challenge, global problem without global leaderships. And we are looking for new global leadership for, to, to face this challenge. Let me start from the nature of our international relation nowadays. It's clear that as has been clearly and rightly pointed out by the previous speakers that what we are facing now is a very conflicting direction. On one hand, we have a need, a need to more interaction and cooperation to recover and to heal as one. But what we have on the ground is the other way around. Countries are closing their border. Countries are, tend to be more protective and countries tend to be more inward looking. So how to bridge between the two trends? How to work to, to bridge between the two directions? The only thing from, at least from the uh, point of view of Indonesia, the only thing is to increase our interaction through digital economy. Why, why digital economy? Because it's clear in digital economy, border is, uh, uh, is disregarded. Border has no, I mean, uh, in digital economy, there is no restriction uh, on, on border issues or, or, uh, or restricted geography on industrial sectors. If you see the figure, can you, okay. If you see this figure, in 2016, the value of digital economy is around 11.5 trillion US dollar. It means that 15.5% of the GDP, the global GDP. And in 2025, it will be 23 trillion at least. It could be to 23 plus. And then it will consist of 24.3 GDP, global GDP. In 2016, digital economy was growing, benefiting from the spillover of non-digital economy. But in 2015, the situation will be changing. Instead of benefiting from non-digital economy, 
the digital economy itself will create what we call it digital spillover. So from benefiting from a, a, a spillover in 2025, it will create its own spillover. And digital economy will be very interesting because according to uh, uh, the prediction, the digital economy can create return on investment 6.7 times bigger and faster than non-digital economy. That's why the uh, digital economy is getting, getting more important for, for all countries. Two weeks ago, uh, we initiated a jamboree of startup bilateral jamboree or step up between Indonesia and Turkey. So we try to provide a venue for young startuppers. There were around 50 startup companies, new startup companies from Indonesia and Turkey, and also venture capital are gathering during, the, during, this, uh, during this jamboree. Why Indonesia and Turkey? You can see to the figure on the screen that uh, Indonesia is now fifth biggest potential startup ecosystem. At least it has five uh, 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 unicorn and one uh, decacon. And digital, digital economy nowadays in Indonesia could raise its value into 40 uh, billion US dollar with 274 million population nowadays and around 60% are internet savvy because they are in the production age and almost 200 million internet users. So, so digital, digital economy is very, very promising in Indonesia. And why Turkey? Because if you see from the, from the picture, from the screen, Turkey has around 84, nowadays Turkey has around 84 million population, 75% are internet users and 50%, 54% are working age. So the value of Turkish digital economy nowadays is around 11.3 billion or it's 1.3 of its GDP, but they are aiming at having 30 billion digital economy value in 2023. With, this, with that, the conclusion is that to bridge between the gap between this uh, this need and and fact after the in the post uh, pandemic life then the best way and i think the most viable option for us to keep our economy generated and moving on is uh, digital economy thank you very much Ambassador, thank you very much. As you were speaking, I went back in history and remembered the Bandung Conference and Panchashila, etc., and how Indonesia was one of the key actors in trying to reshape a world in which more cooperation was possible globally rather than just within the confines of the Cold War. So it, it goes back a long way that Indonesian and Indian efforts have been uh, directed toward achieving greater international cooperation. So with those observations, let me turn to Ambassador Panda uh, and hear from you about international cooperation. Thank you, Professor Turan. It's, uh, you know, in a sense, it's good to be the last speaker because I have seen that uh, my esteemed uh, ambassador colleagues have already stolen my points, which I so meticulously prepared. But that also gives you the opportunity that you get to have the last word, but I don't trust Professor Turan, he may come back and pose more questions. So, well, I entirely endorse the views uh, expressed uh, by my colleague ambassadors. I just, uh, think that it's really pertinent to mention a few points without uh, going into details uh, of uh, what this pandemic has meant for the entire humanity, for the international order. One thing is for sure that we know that is failed to live up to 
address this concern when the world was moving in a direction the way it reacted now there is a universal feeling that the international order the post pandemic world order need to be transformed now it may be a little premature at this stage but the nature and extent of transformation that would be required the one thing that we all accept that international cooperation has to be multiplied and so that it is there is an equitable distribution and fairness in the globalized world all of us accept that this pandemic is the greatest shock to the international community since the second world war in fact the economic downturn and the economic slowdown is the worst or the most severe that we have faced since the great depression of the 1920s and 30s and since the primary cause is econ of this disruption is economic the way we get out of this uh, is also by resumption of economic activity and if we don't do it sooner this recession might get into a depression and from our experience from the 1920s and 30s from the great depression days whenever there is an uh, we have recessions these are usually managed by fiscal stimuli or with expansionist budgets and interest rate cuts you know this formula started after the great depression in the 20s 30s and uh, uh, of course uh, in uh, the g20 came up in 2008 uh, to face the economic crisis a, uh, uh, that was coordinated and it was an unprecedented fiscal stimulus package which was announced what is different now the aggregated financial stimulus which has been uh, uh, which is envisas now is much larger but the difference is that today it is not a coordinated move nations are making their own individual plans and they are announcing which is a little worrisome because uh, as the british ambassador said uh, you have to have the mask which you have to put on first before attending to others but uh, there's a little different scenario i mean we uh, the way we look at it uh, ambassador in fact uh, there were many who were skeptical when india came up with this plan that okay uh, uh, we have to in parallel while we are vaccinating ourselves to also send out the vaccines out to the world where it is needed to our friends partners and also <laughs> contribute to covax and uh, today as we speak i mean till yesterday 57 million doses of uh, vaccines made in india vaccines have already reached out to 57 countries apart from the contribution to covax so this itself i mean this speaks of the indian ethos of uh, vasudeva kutumbakam which actually means uh, the world is one family so we have to mention that this uh, as all the three ambassadors uh, implied and mentioned that uh, what the pandemic has taught us that uh, the uh, the our borders have really become blurred and when the indonesian ambassador mentioned about moving to a digital world but this also means that we are entering into newer fault lines the newer fault lines of digital haves and have nots not all countries have the luxury of getting into the digital uh, uh, digital world and reap benefits so that is why we don't have a choice but get into the international collaboration and have development partnerships uh, uh, this pandemic what it has shown that actually all countries are impacted it has exposed the vulnerability of the developed countries including major economic powerhouses in fact two of our largest economies it's really uh, i mean if you look at it uh, you know 
the pandemic has left its mark both on China and the United States. It started in one and it has killed the most in the other. And of course, so far as the European Union is concerned, I mean, in the post-Brexit scenario, it is really interesting to see how it maintains its solidarity uh, and cohesion uh, to remain credible as a single entity. So these are challenges that we have to fa face up with. And another thing that I wanted to mention, another point that I wanted to mention, there is a new debate which has started whether uh, that concerns about the merits of globalization or localization. You know, decoupling and uh, deglobalization are advocated by many who would like to alter the current uh, geometry of international supply chains. Perhaps uh, globalization is a possible compromise. It's a mix between globalization and localization and uh, regional and plurilateral uh, supply chains also can be seen as another halfway house and of course uh, uh, as we mentioned uh, this pandemic has also shown the expanding market of it and it enabled services so your entire configuration even in the economic sphere has to undergo a change Friends, all crises change or alter the geopolitics. Now, will the geopolitical impact of COVID-19, will it be disruptive or will it be uh, transformational? I mean, this is the question that everyone is contending with. To tell you honestly, all that we know that uh, one thing which is certain, as uh, my Indonesian colleague said, that uh, this is we have a whole lot of uncertainties about what we are facing now. You know, when we really do not know how the post pandemic world will look like. However, what we do know that substantive international cooperation is fundamental to deal with this uh, existing and the emerging global challenges. You know, the lines uh, dividing on the basis of uh, dividing countries on the basis of their development metrics are getting progressively blurred uh, in the, and will get progressively blurred as we, uh, you know, uh, lead to the future cooperation paradigm. I am uh, reminded of a few, uh, uh, you know, instances when international cooperation was actually taken to the next level. And I was reminded in particular to a recent initiative of the International Solar Alliance, which was jointly launched by India and France on the sidelines of COP21 in Paris, and which uh, today has over 90 member countries this kind of initiative which addresses common global concerns should be the norm now. Another initiative that uh, comes uh, to mind, which is wide ranging uh, global ramification is the Coalition of Disaster Resilient Infrastructure or CDRI, which was launched by the Indian Prime Minister at the UN Climate Action Summit in New York in September 2019. Similarly, in uh, vaccine development, uh, the triple helix method uh, that combines pharma companies, academic research institution, and contracted manufacturers demonstrates uh, uh, what my uh, French colleague would say, uh, collaboration sans frontières, or collaboration without borders. So uh, the British, uh, Swedish firm AstraZeneca joining hands with Oxford and uh, the Serum Institute of India illustrates this uh, point. So today we are actually facing three main prospects. Number one, with the crisis acquiring global dimensions, COVID-19 is a game changer in international relations, including development partnership. Second, in a globalized world, everything is interlinked and 
uh, interdependent. While there is a lot of the criticism of multilateral institutions, uh, let's agree that this, these are going to stay. These are here to stay. Strengthening multilateralism, bypassing ideological differences or narrow nationalistic positions will help bridge the gaps in international cooperation. And finally, in the face of serious global economic downturn, we are caught in a catch-22 situation. Whether to look, uh, look for a quick fix or a somewhat protracted smart recovery that is sustainable, addresses the, our uh, SDG commitments and climate change concerns. It is the latter, that is the smart recovery, that envisages international collaboration to build back better. In fact, this is trending now, BBB. Build back better, suggesting a cleaner technology-driven green recovery. This is what we should aspire for. I mean, all said and done, the pandemic has shown the limitation of the existing international system. And, uh, you know, so far, a purely economic agenda was defining the globalization. But now the time has come to bring about a change. We need a new template of globalization based on fairness and equity in the post-COVID world. And this template, in this template, of course, the political content of a more multipolar global conversation will be the new normal. So we have to learn to live. It's important to strengthen multilateralism, but at the same time, we have to learn to live uh, learn to live with bilateralism and plurilateralism, which have to move also on a parallel track. So uh, with these words, I think uh, we all agree that we need new ideas, uh, new synergies, uh, uh, you know, as we reconfigure the post-pandemic world order. Thank you very much. Ambassador, thank you. Actually, you posed a number of what I would call $64,000 questions. I'm not necessarily persuaded that any one of us is capable of providing an answer, but we must all work toward trying to find an answer. So thank you very much. I, I remember some years ago hearing something that, you know, when people work on plane arrivals at the airports. If a plane arrives 15 minutes early or 15 minutes late, it is considered on time. We are actually done three minutes early, so we are on time. And may I take this opportunity to thank every one of you very much for this rather colorful discussion. Uh, obviously, you offered us food for thought and do our attention to some of the limitations and some of the possibilities. I think we will leave this panel enriched by the experience. So thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Magro, uh, Sir Dominic, Ambassador, uh, and uh, Ambassador Panzai Panda, and Nalu Mohamedikbay. Uh, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, Ambassadors Macro, Mr. Mr. Cholka, um, Ambassador Panda, and Ambassador Iqbal, thank you very much. And to you, Professor Turan, for once again uh, moderating this very interesting session. All right, I think it's uh, time to take a quick break. Um, we have some coffee for you and some small beverages and snacks outside, so please indulge yourself. Let's meet back here in about uh, 10 minutes so we can sort of move the discussion into construction and real estate we're going to see how the pandemic has sort of changed our appetite for um, real estate and whether or not this has sort of sped the transition into smart cities. Back after a short break. Thank you.